My name is Dr. Ted Bromond. I'm a senior research fellow in Anglo-American relations in the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation. I also have a background in international relations and international security, which is why, along with my interest in treaties of all varieties, I take a particular interest in the, our discussion today. There are a lot of things that we could do in the United States to damage ourselves, uh, high deficits, uh, to defense spending that is too low to meet our needs, a loss of the awareness of the value of citizenship. But there's only one thing that could change us fundamentally, rapidly, and irreversibly, which is a major WMD attack. We can't know, and in my view, we can't even imagine what American life would be like after such an attack. 9-11 would be the merest foretaste. Our guest today plays a key role on the diplomatic side in preventing that from happening. If there's been any genuinely bipartisan issue in U.S. foreign policies in, since World War II, I would venture to suggest that it might be counterproliferation policy. U.S. administrations have differed, sometimes vehemently, on the how of the policy, but they have differed a lot less on the why of it. Some scholars have on occasion argued that the U.S. would be safer if more states, not fewer, had nuclear weapons, but no president has found that argument very convincing. This is definitely one instance where the practitioners have, it seems to me, a clear edge on the academics. For some years after the end of the Cold War, nuclear proliferation appeared to be that rare thing, a solved problem. The U.S. had a lot of successes in counterproliferation in the late Cold War and immediately after it was over. It took intellectual courage and integrity to keep on being interested in the subject during the following years. But now, counterproliferation is fashionable again. If we are lucky, that will not prevent it from being treated as a subject worthy of the kind of serious thought that it received during the Cold War. In my view, there are three reasons, there are always three reasons for everything, uh, why counterproliferation matters again. There is the return of great power conflict. Second, and in a slightly contrary sense, there is a democratizing effect of technology and the potential for mass violence. This is something we've done better at controlling than we hoped we might do in the 1950s and 60s, but our failures have still been painful enough. And third, there is the new attention that the left has given to proliferation and to nuclear weapons, attention that in my view has been thoroughly misdirected. We here at Heritage strongly criticize the left's view that the NPT is basically a disarmament treaty and that it applies to the U.S. as much or more than it does to anyone else. Our view is that the NPT is precisely what it says on the label, a non-proliferation treaty. We now have a so-called nuclear weapons ban treaty out there, a purported treaty that few people have criticized more thoughtfully than our guest today. Like many other instruments created by the new diplomacy, such as the arms trade treaty, the ban treaty is an example of an aspirational document defined by pious wishes and restricted pseudo-norms, not serious commitments. Unfortunately, in both the nuclear and conventional realms, those wishes and pseudo-norms can have a real effect on both the public debate and actual U.S. policy. It's because our guest today is a master of that policy that I'm delighted to welcome him here to the Heritage Foundation. Dr. Christopher Ford was sworn in as Assistant Secretary for International Security and Nonproliferation in the U.S. Department of State on January 9, 2018. Before coming to ISN, Dr. Ford served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction and Counterproliferation at the National Security Council. He has a long prior career on the Hill and in the State Department, and as a Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute. He is the author of three books and many, many articles and monographs. He served as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Navy Reserve for almost 20 years. He earned an A.B., summa cum laude, from Harvard, a D.Phil at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, and a J.D. at Yale Law. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ford to the podium for his remarks on how the United States is building and strengthening an effective counterproliferation policy. Dr. Ford. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is indeed a pleasure to be here. I'm grateful for the chance to speak to you today um, about an aspect of our work at the State Department that is sometimes uh, all too unfortunately overlooked, um, counterproliferation. But I should start with some definitions in the sense that I am frequently asked, what is counterproliferation and how does it differ from nonproliferation? What do these words actually mean? 
I'm not aware of any canonical official answer, so you can rest assured that I'm just going to make this up. Um, but, but from my perspective, where I work right now, I think of this in an informal way um, as follows. Counterproliferation is a, uh, a subcomponent, if you will, of nonproliferation policy. It's sort of the, the most proactive piece of nonproliferation. Uh, you might call it non-pro with attitude. Um, in this typology that I use, um, traditional nonproliferation work involves creating and maintaining barriers uh, to the flow of dangerous technologies into dangerous hands, uh, dangerous state or non-state hands, I should specify, um, impeding transfer of weapons of mass destruction, delivery systems, advanced conventional weapons, and that sort of thing, uh, as well as the materials, technology, uh, and know-how uh, that help make those things possible. In traditional nonproliferation policy, we work to prevent technology and material from getting into such hands by ensuring that effective institutions, legal authorities, uh, and practices are in place that make it easier for responsible parties to detect and prevent such activity before it occurs. Now, counterproliferation, or CP as I'll sometimes refer to it, goes a step beyond just that kind of barrier building. Uh, whereas traditional nonproliferation seeks to lock down and prevent destabilizing movement of mankind's most dangerous capabilities, counterproliferation directs itself in a sense against the proliferation-related activities themselves. CP targets particular transfers for interdiction to ensure that they do not reach their intended destination, and it aims to disrupt and to dismantle the networks of illicit merchants, brokers, shippers, transshippers, middlemen, financiers, facilitators, um, and all that sort of stuff um, who organize and, uh, and run such networks. In one form or another, we in the US have been doing CP work for quite some time. Uh, but it really bloomed as a focus of intense effort uh, in the early 2000s, led by officials such as uh, John Bolton when he was Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, and Bob Joseph, um, first at the NSC and then also as Under Secretary. CP is, of course, a top priority for this administration as well. Now, the toolkit that we use in order to disrupt proliferation-related transactions begins, as so many important steps do, with good intel. Uh, indeed, the U.S. intelligence community has done a very good job uh, of building up its capabilities to inform um, and support CP priorities. The U.S. interagency has developed effective mechanisms um, to partner with the IC, the intelligence community, to share information and to bring officials from a kaleidoscope of different departments and agencies together to work collaboratively on dynamic proliferation targets in real time. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, and there's only so much I can talk about, but you hope I, you just have to trust me that this is in some ways one of the fantastic examples of how it is that a U.S. interagency bureaucracy can come together and do, in fact, effective things efficiently and, and proactively in real time. It's a wonderful success story, and we work with these people and in part of that process all the time. At State, uh, we are intimately involved in this CP work, and we participate in the key interagency mechanisms that, and the processes through which it gets done. As the lead department for U.S. diplomatic and foreign policy engagement with other states, we, of course, play a, a, a key role in this in interdiction policy. Since the 1990s, um, we have chaired uh, four interagency working groups, for instance, that review information on proliferation-related activities and that take diplomatic and other actions to stop transfers that pose proliferation risks. There are four of these working groups that I'll flag. Um, one of them is the Nuclear Interdiction Action Group, the NIAG. It works on proliferation of, works against, the proliferation of nuclear weapons-related technologies. Um, there's the Missile Trade Analysis Group, the MTAG. It focuses on the proliferation of equipment that will not, shockingly, as you will learn, relate to missiles. Um, it is, there's also the Shield Group, which follows transactions suitable for the uh, transactions of materials and technologies uh, suitable for the production of chemical and biological weapons. And then there is the Technology Transfer Working Group, uh, the generic nature of the name uh, concealing the fact that it works on conventional weapons, things that don't fall into the above categories. Um, these are important groups by which we coordinate our action, and they are extremely effective, and we're very proud of the role that we play in, in them. Once it's understood that a transaction of concern is perhaps in the works or that information is obtained uh, about global proliferation networks, the U.S. has a range of tools that we can employ to try to disrupt these activities. With diplomatic outreach, through law enforcement activity, or through other channels, um, the U.S. may engage, for example, with our foreign partners in order to enlist their help in stopping the transactions en route, seizing and disposing of the items in question, arresting or expelling uh, individuals involved, or shuttering the associated commercial entities. 
where there are mechanisms, additionally, under relevant UN Security Council resolutions, we can also report activities uh, to the UN uh, and seek to have entities involved in them designated as sanctions violators so that other UN member states will be legally obligated to take action against those malefactors as well. And once a transfer of sensitive technology to a program of concern has occurred, there are also, of course, a range of tools that we can use, legal authorities, that we can employ to impose sanctions on the entities or individuals involved and those who protect or facilitate their work, imposing a financial and reputational cost upon them and complicating their ability to conduct business in the international marketplace in the future. We might use commerce or treasury or State Department authorities under executive order, for instance, to penalize support for proliferation facilitating work and deny proliferators the resources and materials that they need to do their dirty work. Um, in addition to executive orders, there may be statutory bases for doing this. Um, as one example, the Iran, North Korea, and Syria Nonproliferation Act, uh, it's known as INCSNA, uh, does, allows us to target any entity or individual or even a government uh, that provides controlled items to those three named countries. And that is just but one of the many laws that we have in our arsenal for this. Employing these tools, multiple tools, simultaneously and in a coordinated way can be an extremely effective means to help stop such activity in its tracks and to chase the bad actors responsible around the world, making their lives, frankly, as miserable and unprofitable as possible, and sometimes even getting them put behind bars. Now, we don't do this alone, nor should we. In fact, we've been working for years to build international CP partnerships, one of the most important of which you will probably have heard of, and that is the Proliferation Security Initiative, PSI. Launched in 2003, PSI is a global effort to stop the trafficking of WMD delivery systems and related materials to and from states of, and non-state actors, of proliferation concern. Now, originally, it was a group of about 11 states, um, but now 105 countries have endorsed its Statement of Interdiction Principles, and three successive U.S. administrations um, have supported PSI. PSI partners agree to use their national capabilities and their national legal authorities to interdict transfers of proliferation concern, as well as to develop procedures for facilitating information exchange, strengthening national legal authorities for interdiction, and taking specific actions in support of interdiction efforts. They also undertake exercises and capacity building engagements around the world to reinforce their counterproliferation like mindedness and to build habits of cooperation that we can all draw upon in stopping problematic transfers. Now, one thing, and you, here at Heritage, you may be particularly appreciative of this, PSI is an activity by like-minded partners. It is not a formal organization. It doesn't have members, it doesn't have a secretariat, a governing body, or even formal means of, uh, of accession. Um, it is an informal and flexible network, and I think this informality and this flexibility has helped it survive and be effective over time. It is a strength rather than a weakness. It's allowed PSI to avoid some of the bureaucratic ossification, the lowest common denominator consensus-based decision-making, and uh, frankly, sterile formalities that one sees in all too many international organizations and multilateral fora. The activities that we do in PSI, the workshops we do, the capacity-building engagements, uh, they've all helped partner countries uh, build and sustain what is, in fact, a global community of policymakers and other experts who are good at cooperating together on interdiction-related activities and oriented around doing so. We work hard at this every day, and PSI continues to conduct a robust schedule of meetings and engagements all around the world to this end. And we've had some successes, and here's where this sort of gets fun, because I'll give you some examples. We have had real successes in making proliferation facilitating activity much more difficult, more expensive, more risky, and, and here's the point, of course, more rare than would otherwise have been the case. It's true, there cannot be anything like a 100% solution in this line of work. The world is full of dangerous people and lots of folks trying to make money by helping meet the demand for dangerous toys. But our CP work supports critical U.S. national security priorities, and it helps make the world a safer place by disrupting such activity wherever possible and by impeding progress on threat systems. Hard to talk about some of this in public, as you'll, you'll not be surprised to hear. Uh, a lot of this work depends upon sensitive intelligence information, it piggybacks upon it, and it involves sensitive relationships with overseas partners, not all of whom are necessarily eager to be known as folks who cooperate with us on this or sometimes anything at all. Um, but they often do. And it is, of course, often better from an operational perspective to let the proliferators think that their latest gambit has just collapsed out of, uh, say, bad luck, or, or better yet, out of the, uh, the untrustworthiness or the incompetence of their counterparties in some kind of a deal. It's good for them to think that, even if, um, when, their, uh, you know, their, their, when their deal fell apart or their colleague got arrested or their front company got shut down, 
even if when in fact what happens after that occurs is that there are a bunch of us sitting around at the State Department, the Treasury Department, or in the intelligence community or elsewhere, raising a glass and toasting ourselves for helping bring this about. Sometimes that's exactly what happens. Let me give you a couple of examples. There aren't too many we can talk about publicly for all of those reasons, but one of the examples is a bit older, um, but it's a, it's a fantastic success. It's still worth telling. And it has to do with a merchant vessel called the BBC China. It was a ship diverted to Italy in October of 2003 while it was carrying uranium enrichment gas centrifuges from the notorious Pakistani nuclear smuggler, AQ Khan, en route to the secret nuclear weapons program then underway at the behest of Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. The interdiction of the BBC China was the result of a truly epic intelligence, diplomatic, and law enforcement effort around the world that led to the dismantlement of AQ Khan's network and the revelation of its support to nuclear weapons programs in North Korea and Iran, as well as in Libya. The ship's seizure was also the catalyst for making possible the conclusion of secret negotiations that were then already underway between US and British officials and the Libyans over Libya's WMD programs. And the seizure led directly to Gaddafi's renunciation of WMD and missile work in December of 2003 and our subsequent negotiated and cooperative removal of those programs from Libya thereafter. This was a period of tremendous CP successes, and uh, frankly, I'm proud to have been in my first period of service at the State Department, part of a small army of people who helped make this happen. That was a while ago, so let me give you a better, more recent example, not a better one, that was just a fantastic one. Um, a more recent example of successful work, and that is a, a case study in how we work to impede North Korea's efforts to evade international sanctions um, through the use of illicit ship-to-ship -ship transfers of contraband. While these, are, these shipments are mostly focused on commodities such as coal and petroleum and seafood, um, these sanctions evading activities are one of the ways in which the North Korean regime attempts to provide for itself the resources that it needs to continue with its illicit WMD and its missile programs. There's a ship called the Jinhui. I don't know how to pronounce that right, but let's just assume you can roll with me on this one. The Jinhui was a Sierra Leone flagged vessel and it was photographed in December of 2017, engaged in ship-to-ship -ship transfer activity with another vessel in the East China Sea. Now, UN Security Council resolutions prohibit ship-to-ship -ship transfers with the DPRK as part of the sanctions regime. So after we received these images as part of our, you know, out, coming out of our global counterproliferation information sharing network, we had to do some detective work, which revealed that although the operator of the vessel had tried to disguise its identity, and this is actually kind of fun, because this is, this is all, this is, this is what people do routinely, they tried to disguise this identity by painting a false IMO number, the International Maritime Organization number, um, on the side of the vessel. They painted a false name um, and a port of registry that was also false on the stern. And they painted over its DPRK flag. Um, but you can figure these things out if you stare at them carefully enough in many cases, and we did. Um, and it soon became clear that the second vessel was the North Korean Chonmasan. Um, so we now knew that the Jinhe was involved in sanctions evasion activity with the North Koreans in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. And having figured this out, our diplomatic machine kicked into action. We presented this information, first of all, to the United Nations, uh, the DPRK Sanctions Committee in New York, which designated both the Jinhe and the Chonmasan for violating UN sanctions on North Korea. This action imposed a global ban, a port ban, on both vessels, forbidding any UN member state from allowing the ship and either ship into port. Additionally, this UN action obligated Sierra Leone to deflag the Jinhe while the Chomastan was, was subject to a, an asset freeze. With these designations in hand, we sent out teams around the world and worked through our posts and missions as applicable to make life even more miserable for the Jinhe's operators. We worked with Sierra Leone to ensure that it really did revoke the flag of convenience affiliation that the vessel had enjoyed, making it officially stateless in a sense and therefore akin to something like a pirate on the high seas. We worked with other countries to revoke the ship's official seaworthiness certification and to drop its insurance coverage that the vessel had previously enjoyed and to close down the companies in a different jurisdiction that had operated the vessel. And we even got someone to arrest one of the operators. This, of course, dramatically constrained the vessel's ability and the operator's ability to do this kind of thing in the future or even to operate in the international maritime economy ever again. It's a fun story, there's a lot of sort of a CSI flair to it, but it's just one example. And of course, I cannot promise you that things always go so well. They don't always go so well. But this gives a taste of what we do day in and day out as we try to use our CP toolkit to protect the American people from the dangers of WMD, missile, and advanced conventional weapons proliferation. 
My bureau is the State Department's lead for CP, and I'm enormously proud of all the fantastic work that our ISN team does. We have some of them in the audience here today. Thank you for coming. I didn't demand that they come. Um, <laughs> Um, they don't get to sort of, forgive me for talking about you guys in, in, in your presence here, Th these folks don't get out into the public facing world much, as you might imagine, um, and it's, uh, I hope it's kind of a cool opportunity and I hope the audience will uh, not be shy about expressing their appreciation if they feel it uh, for all the cool work that you do after we finish up with this. But, uh, but there are some still, some very significant challenges that we of course still face. And let me flag a few of those. There are five that I want to talk about just quickly. One continuing challenge, of course, is to exert sustained pressure on North Korea to achieve the final and fully verified denuclearization that was promised at the summit in Singapore by Chairman Kim Jong-un. U.S. officials have been crystal clear about the importance of maintaining sanctions pressure on North Korea, and sanctions will be maintained until North Korea denuclearizes. We will keep working with partners around the world to do some of the things that I was describing to you today. Um, and also to work with those partners to improve their capabilities and their willingness to combat DPRK invasion, evasions. President Trump told the Security Council in September that ship-to-ship -ship transfers must end immediately, and we are indeed working with our partners to patrol the sea lanes and to detect, punish, and to end such transfers. We are, in fact, working to shut down every tendril and node of the networks through which Pyongyang obtains revenue for its WMD and its missile programs, and we need to keep doing this even while North Korea steps up its own efforts to trick our friends and allies into relaxing sanctions pressures. That would lead Pyongyang to conclude that it doesn't actually have to implement denuclearization after all. We want to make sure that is not an available option. So that's the first challenge. Second one, Syria, where of course the murderous Assad regime is in the final stages of slaughtering its citizens in pursuit of victory in that country's tragic civil war. With the Syrian regime having so appallingly used chemical weapons in that war, we are concerned that Syria could soon seek to rebuild and advance its illegal chemical weapons capabilities as well as its missile force. Counterproliferation partners around the world thus need to be ready so that we can do everything possible to stop Syria's chemical and ballistic missile recapitalization. Third, and these are in no particular order, but third, Iran. Until we have success, in using our recently reimposed sanctions to persuade Iran to reach a better and more comprehensive solution of the sort outlined by Secretary of State Pompeo in this building, I believe, on the 21st of May. Uh, until we get to that point, we need to be fiercely vigilant against Iranian proliferation. We will work tirelessly to disrupt the illicit networks through which Iran obtains technology and materials for its missile development, through which it provides missile technology to others, and through which Iran may attempt to obtain dual-use goods in support of a return to nuclear weapons work or in support of its illicit chemical weapons capability. We will also address Iran's proliferation of missiles and other advanced systems that threaten regional peace and stability. Entities and individuals that support Iran's procurement and proliferation activities need to know that this will expose them to sanctions and that we will not hesitate to penalize those who assist Iran's illicit programs. Fourth. This is, a slight, this is one that I don't talk about a lot publicly, but I want to, to, to emphasize it today. We face a major challenge from the ability of proliferator regimes, such as Iran and North Korea, to take advantage of major global transshipment points that otherwise facilitate legitimate trade. There is unfortunately an ongoing trade in which both sensitive technologies and uncontrolled items flow through major transshipment nodes of the global trading economy and end up in weapon systems in states such as Syria, Iran, and North Korea. Failures of enforcement in transshipment jurisdictions are thus contributing to regional and to global instability, fueling conflicts that could explode catastrophically at any time. It is critical that we do more against these transshipment threats, such as taking proactive steps to make the full use of so-called catch-all export controls and implementing the efficient methods of cargo tracking and monitoring that are now available but that some still choose not to use. Where necessary, we will need to crack down on those who refuse to help meet these threats. And fifth, and finally, of my challenges, I would note that we face a major challenge from China in the counterproliferation business. China, which still remains the supplier of choice for many of the world's proliferators, especially with regard to missile technology. U.S. diplomats have repeatedly and insistently raised numerous proliferation cases with Chinese officials, but the response is uneven at best. Often, very little action is taken. Much of this we cannot discuss in public, but there is one long-standing case that I do wish to highlight before I conclude. Li Fenghui, 
known also as Carl Lee, is a key China-based broker for Iran's ballistic missile program. Lee continues to support Iran's ongoing efforts to develop more sophisticated missiles and drive for self-sufficiency in its program. For more than a decade, we have sought to end Li Fangwei's support to Iran's program, taking numerous legal and administrative actions against him and engaging extensively with the Chinese government about his proliferation activity. This is important because over his career, Li has supplied Iran with a full range of the materials required to construct ballistic missiles and the equipment and components he has provided have contributed to Iran's development of missiles with improved accuracy, improved range, and improved lethality. So let me be clear. Li Fangwei's continued proliferation to Iran makes clear that Beijing has failed to take effective action to curb his activity. Beijing's reluctance to take concrete measures to prevent Li's ongoing support to Iran's missile program suggests that China chooses not to resolve this problem, calling into question its own commitment to nonproliferation. China's inability or its unwillingness to curtail such activities is of ongoing and increased concern, and it represents one of the key challenges in the counterproliferation business today. So as that discussion of the challenges indicates, there is still clearly a great deal to do. But I hope that I have been able to give you at least a taste of the range and variety of our CP work. Despite flying, in many ways, usually beneath the radar of most public policy discourse, these counterproliferation efforts need and they deserve unstinting commitment and high-level support from across the policy community. And so I'm pleased to be able to draw them to your attention a bit today, and I'm grateful for the chance to be here. Thank you very much. And if it should so move you, please talk to some of my folks here. Uh, there are a couple of them here in the front row and maybe others sneaking around in the back if they're willing to identify themselves uh, and, and thank them for what they do because it's amazing stuff. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you very much, Dr. Ford. Uh, Dr. Ford will take a few questions before we have to conclude. Uh, I will take the usual moderator's prerogative and, and ask the, the first one. About you know, 15, 18 years ago, uh, the emphasis on counterproliferation was largely on um, terrorist groups. I think of President Bush, second President Bush's speech at West Point in 2002, I believe it was, where he said the greatest threat to the United States arise at the intersection between radical ideologies and weapons of mass destruction. He wasn't talking about states there. He was talking about al-Qaeda. It's interesting that in your catalog of, of five key challenges, uh, non-state actors don't appear at all. Is this because we've moved into a new, new era of great power competition where we're really more concerned with, well, at least powers, not great powers like North Korea? Or are we still just as concerned with the al-Qaeda's of the world as President Bush was at West Point in 2002? Uh, well, we're certainly very still concerned um, with non-state actor threats. Um, it's not usually the, I mean, Hopefully it's not anybody, but uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that I'm talking about, things like ship-to-ship -ship transfers and uh, elaborate pro proliferation networks of the sort built uh, under, uh, well, with the help of Li Fangui in China, for example. Um, those things tend more to be the kind of thing that state markets help engender, right? They, the, the demand signal draws out a much more elaborate series of support uh, and, and, uh, and, and facilitating infrastructure around the world than does usually the kind of thing you might see from an isolated terrorist camp someplace. But both are extraordinarily important. We work against both sets of threats. The CP stuff that I'm describing has been mostly directed at the sort of state rogue regime type problems, um, though not exclusively by any means. Um, we also work against the weapons of mass destruction terrorism piece. We run a great deal of programming in that area. A lot of it has to do more with the traditional nonproliferation stuff where we are helping build capacity um, in border security, um, and helping people with their training and the human capital developments and uh, physical equipment and exercises that help make them better at uh, border security, screening things, screening um, you know, containers that go across sensitive areas to keep not things from moving in the world, uh, building counter nuclear smuggling expertise. A lot of that is in, more of that is in the, uh, uh, the locking things down so that they don't move. But of course, if things pop up on the radar, the CP infrastructure is built not only to go after state-related uh, transfers. It's not just about ships like the, uh, the Chon Masan. It can be other things as well. Um, the, uh, I, I think the architecture of PSI, in fact, developed, if I recall my history, and I'm a bit fuzzy on some of these details, developed out of uh, a realization that there were challenges with respect to state, to state transfers as well. Um, coming out of the, uh, an episode, I think, in 2002 or so with the, uh, the Sosan. Uh, and a shipment of uh, missiles, I believe, that went ultimately to Yemen. Um, uh, 
So there's been a, a significant focus on the state portion all along, but we're very concerned with both, and we frankly spend a great deal of time and effort and money uh, trying to fight both threats uh, across the board. We will we, we, we take them all very seriously and want to make sure that there's absolutely nothing in state to report in the future. Our objective is to work on stuff out of business. Well, uh, let's, let's hope you're successful in that. <laughs> uh, Jim Phillips here at Heritage, and I wanted to ask you to the extent you can say anything about it, uh, it seems to me that one of the, the most worrisome uh, channels for proliferation uh, is, is between the two countries you mentioned, Iran and North Korea. Uh, what can you say, I mean, if, to what extent can you say anything about uh, what exactly goes back and forth between them and uh, how uh, have we w worked to try to interrupt or uh, disrupt these kind of uh, movements, uh, if, if any? I mean, I've seen a lot on ballistic missile technology, but not so much in the open literature on nuclear technology. I'm afraid this is where I may have to be disappointing in the sense that there's very little that I can, I can talk about here. I try to come up with as many good examples of the, the type of stuff that we do and to make sure that they were appropriately cleared so that I could actually do this and go back to work afterwards and then again tomorrow morning uh, and not worry about federal marshals and things. Um, I don't have anything further on that, I'm sorry. But I can assure you that this is the sort of thing that we absolutely watch like hawks and were we to see anything in motion, it would be a such enormous concern and every tool available to us would be certainly considered in Sorry, I can't say more. Uh, my name is Boris Makarov. I'm from Russian news agency TASS. I have a little bit uh, unrelated question. Uh, it's about the second round of sanctions against Russia um, uh, related to Skripal's case. Uh, uh, have you made a, any decision by now uh, on the composition of this uh, sanc sanctions package and uh, when are you going to announce it? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I actually am asked that frequently, as you might imagine. Um, for those of you not familiar with the background, there is something called uh, the, well, for the sake of concision, the CBW Act, Chemical and Biological Warfare Control and Elimination Act of 1991. That that stipulates that in the event that we determine that a country has used chemical or biological weapons in violation of international law or against its own, its own people, um, we are required um, to impose sanctions against it. Um, in March of this year, uh, we, as, as we've talked about quite a bit publicly, uh, Russia used a chemical agent, uh, specifically the so-called Novichok um, chemical agent, a nerve agent, in an attempted assassination of a fellow by the name of Sergei Skripal and his, his daughter. Um, they were not the only ones harmed. There was actually a couple of additional casualties, one of whom died. Um, very significant act using chemical weapons on, uh, on this, this UK soil in, in Salisbury. Um, we made a determination, the Secretary of uh, the, uh, the State Department under its legal authorities back made a determination that indeed chemical weapons had been used in this case, and we imposed a first round of sanctions against Russia uh, that took effect in August. Under the statute, there is a period in which we need to assess whether Russia has taken certain sort of com you know, corrective steps you know, after this problem. Um, those steps uh, included things like uh, essentially give, providing reliable assurances that it was no longer going to be using chemical weapons again uh, and allowing international, uh, credible international uh, observers to, uh, to, to verify that fact. Uh, it won't shock anyone um, that uh, we were not able to certify that Russia had taken those corrective steps. Uh, and you're quite correct, sir, that uh, that does mean that there will need to be uh, another round. Um, and the statute sets out a series, a menu of, of, of options, if you will, things that, um, that uh, to be considered as part of that. We do not have an interagency decision to answer on what those pieces are yet. It is under active consideration. Uh, as you might imagine, this is a complicated question. Um, and we're trying to make sure that we do our homework right and thoroughly because, uh, well, frankly, to be honest, the, the second round of sanctions under the statute is a a more draconian menu than the first round. It's meant to be, in effect, punitive for not having taken the corrective action. Um, and the more draconian the list of options is, the more carefully it is necessary to weigh um, the pros and cons and risks and benefits, because, of course, what we don't want to do is, is cause external externalities that we don't want. 
we were very careful in the first round to, to have what we thought was a pretty measured answer. We had a series of, uh, of national security related export control sanctions go in against Russia, but we had exceptions for certain types of activity, space launch activity, which we still depend upon in some respects for, uh, for launch services in this country, safety of flight uh, technology, uh, so that the aircraft don't fall from the sky um, and people blame us for it. Um, leaving open the option of humanitarian assistance, foreign assistance uh, for Russia, for example, if we were to engage in democracy uh, building and uh, civil society promotion efforts there. We didn't want to foreclose those options. Um, that is not a way, keeping ourselves from being able to use those options is not a way to, uh, to, to punish the Kremlin for its misdeeds. So we, we, we try to think those through very carefully. The second round is harder, and we are still at work on it. I hope that we'll have an answer soon, but I'm afraid I don't have much for you on that. My name is Cooper Millhouse. I work in the Davis uh, Center for National Defense. Um, my question aims to ask you about policies on nonproliferation regarding our allies rather than our enemies. So while there's a lot of focus on nations like North Korea and the potential for proliferation to occur with them, are there the same policies, both official as well as in the same level of rigor as applied to our allies as to our enemies? Um, Israel comes to mind as, as, a, as a particular nation of interest. Well, it's, it has always been an important part of U.S. security policy in the broadest sense to try to keep the number of players from increasing, the um, number of nuclear armed actors from increasing around the world, um, and to manage as best we can what can't be precluded. Um, we have uh, a very uh, strong and historically very effective approach to providing what we call you know, what's sometimes known as umbrella deterrence or extended deterrence uh, through the alliance relationships that we have in both East Asia and in Europe. Uh, with the NATO alliance uh, in particular in Europe. Um, those have historically been a very powerful non-proliferation tool and are not usually appreciated as such. Um, our alliance with NATO, for example, has, you know, and, and our involvement in providing alliance security uh, in the NATO context has been instrumental in helping persuade a number of countries, um, some of whom are matters of public record and some of whom probably aren't, um, from going down that road themselves. And when considering the possibility of an indigenous weaponization program, um, it is certainly relevant to know whether a big, powerful, muscular friend has your back from across the sea. Um, and to the degree that we have been able to assure people that we do have their back as part of our alliance relationships with them, it has frequently, uh, historically, been possible to essentially elicit the turning off of incipient weapons programs. So our alliance relationships, as much as folks like the former Soviet Union and now Russia complain about those alliance relationships, um, far from being a proliferation problem, it's, they've, they've been part of the global proliferation solution over the years. Um, and this is also true in East Asia, where the strength of our alliance guarantees with South Korea and with Japan have helped uh, forestall, uh, so far, any serious consideration of those kinds of things there, or in perhaps one case have turned it off. Um, those are all good things. Um, so our, our, you know, our net security policy has always had a strong nonproliferation tinge, and the, incident, the, the interest of our alliance management and the reassurances that we provide to our friends and allies through these systems have always run very much in parallel with non-proliferation policy. That has been and remains true uh, in, in all contexts, and uh, we're actually quite proud of our record in that regard. Just one other additional question by particularly about the North Korea issue. Uh, as I said, both in Europe and so on about North Korea, but in Central Asia, both in China and North Korea, um, there's, one, there's so many different Well, we've been we've been quite clear that that uh, you know our tolerated level of sanctions evasion is zero. Um, but by the same token, I, I think in the European context in particular, one needs to be careful to draw a distinction between. Um, so official policy positions and perhaps desired outcomes, um, and what it is in fact practical to achieve. 
Um, I don't know what it is, in fact, practical achieve, to achieve even if they build some of these, these purported pathways. Um, what we have seen so far as we have worked towards the early November reimposition of our sanctions is that irrespective of the official positions of governments, uh, which have been uh, certainly to a great degree hostile to our decision on the JCPOA, um, the actual economic actors uh, around the world, not just in Europe, have also been, you know, they have their own responsibilities to their, their owners, their shareholders, uh, you know, the, the, the parties that were put in risk um, by too much engagement with Iran that would be give rise to, to sanctions exposure. And they've been, in general, acting according to those interests pretty effectively. You see due diligence shops in financial institutions, even if they're European encouragement at some level, um, you, know, you can imagine the advice to the boss, hey, you know, I don't know, they say there's a mechanism to do this, but I'm telling you, we got a lot of international exposure, and I'm not really sure we want to be on US backlists here. And decisions are, are you know, you even see talk of uh, de-swifting um, certain Iranian financial institutions. Uh, so we're actually having a lot of luck with um, uh, getting real-world decision-making to, to conform to the imperatives of pressuring Iran towards a, a real and enduring answer to the many problems that it has created with its malign acts around the region and around the world. Um, and uh, I, I'm not, I, I, I think we're actually on the, the, the very, the, the good side of that ledger um, so far, and that uh, despite all the talk of, of alternative mechanisms, um, at least with respect to Europe in particular, we'll have to see how, uh, you know, Chinese engagements go with Iran and that sort of thing. There may be problems here still, um, but I think the, uh, the free portions of the global economy are responding quite rationally to the uh, sanctions exposure that we are now forcing them to consider. Hi, sir. Tom Spore here for the Center for National Defense and Heritage Foundation. Let's uh, assume for a moment that we're wildly successful with our, our attempts to denuclearize uh, North Korea. Curious as to whether or not when we get to the point where we set up or have to need a, a ver an organization to verify their compliance with the terms, you know, rigorous and intrusive inspections, ad hoc, uh, all those types of things, whether we would uh, be uh, happy and reliant on the IAEA, as we, I think we did in the JCPOA completely to run that program, or would we, uh, having looked at that experience and other experiences, uh, prefer or uh, insist on some other, or other organization, maybe the IAEA augmented with something else or something else augmented with the IAEA, if that makes question makes sense. Sure. I mean, there's obviously a limit on what I could say at this point because the planning processes for this are still very much underway and uh, it's not the sort of thing that we would want to sort of signal too much in advance. But what we have said publicly, um, a number of officials and uh, have made it very clear that we do envision a very important role for the IAEA. Um, in verifying uh, North Korea's compliance with denuclearization. Um, there is a distinction between verifying and actually doing the doing. Uh, the IA is not a dismantlement organization. Um, it's not equipped or for that. It's not its mandate. It has no desire <laughs> to do that sort of thing and doesn't have the resourcing to do it anyway. So there would presumably need to be a separate process for, for getting out what need to be, needs to be gotten out. Um, the IA clearly would have a role in verifying um, that it had in fact been done and providing the kind of international uh, imprimatur to the process that we were very successful in, in working with them to achieve in Libya, for example, on a very much smaller scale. Um, but the details are still, uh, still, you know, they're either not known or they're not something about which I can talk and I can't parse between those for present purposes. So um, under active consideration and we are firmly uh, aware and fixed upon the importance of making sure that, uh, uh, that this process is not just done but verified. The phrasing of final and fully verified denuclearization is no coincidence. Uh, it is, uh, you know, that is that is precisely the objective, and we hope uh, to do everything we can to incentivize the North Koreans to agree to implement all of that as swiftly as possible. And when they do, they will get to have that bright, sanctions-free light at the end of the tunnel will, will finally come true for them. But until then, no way. Thank you. My name is Mikhail Trugiev, Russian news agency, Ria Novosti. Uh, it's a question regarding INF treaty and START treaty, if possible. Uh, first, USA is now about to quit INF, and Russia is now thinks that it's the first step to quit START treaty as well. And nevertheless, uh, we still don't see any attempts to start a real dialogue between two countries, between sp experts, specialists, ministries, whatever. Uh, Russian party says that 
uh, it offered it many times, but they have no response from the American side. Could you please answer the question, when do you think it, you, uh, it is appropriate to start this dialogue? When or under what circumstances? Thank you. In, in fairness, um, arms control issues are not uh, in my portfolio at the department, but it's certainly easy enough to say that, uh, uh, well, actually, uh, quite, I, I was actually honored to be part of the, the inaugural round of stability talks with Russia in Helsinki uh, last year, um, just over a year ago, uh, when I was in the National Security Council staff. Um, and I'd remind you that, of course, it was Russia that pulled down um, plans to have a second round of that. Um, and of course, it is Russia that has been violating its, its INF obligations for, for years now, uh, and it has failed to respond to years of diplomatic engagement by us, by our partners, to try to bring some kind of resolution to that problem. Um, it is Russia that has failed to respond to the strategy that we made very clear last summer uh, in announcing our new approach to, to not just wagging our finger at Russia for its violations, but to, in fact, beginning to provide concrete incentives for Russia to change course in the hope that we'll persuade it um, to make the right choice here and return to compliance. Um, we made very clear last year as part of this strategy fact that the, the preferred option was that everyone, you know, that Russia come back into compliance and everyone be in compliance with the treaty, that's sort of option A. Um, we were, you know, if that was not available, option C, where the treaty falls apart, was something we were willing to contemplate. And we're willing to take concrete steps to show that we were willing to contemplate option C. But we also wanted to make it very clear that B, in the middle, which is the current status quo where we are constrained by the treaty and Russia is not and is building whatever it feels it wants anyway. Um, that we were taking B off the table. Um, it should be of a surprise to no one um, that our patience is going to be, was always going to be finite when it came to that question, and Russia's complete refusal to change course or take any step uh, to acknowledge any of this problem or to show a sign forward, a viable path towards this resolution, that should, it, it should not surprise anybody that uh, Russia's refusal to even acknowledge this as a problem uh, was going to have consequences. So we'll see where this goes, um, but uh, a U.S. problem. It's a Russian problem that they have unfortunately confronted all of us with, uh, and uh, we have been working very closely with our allies all the way along to make sure this is handled uh, in ways that meet our collective security needs. And uh, that was something that Russia wanted to make it impossible for us to do, and as I say, we've taken that off the table. Thank you very much.